Hello everyone, and welcome to eLearn Chat, where you always learn something new. I'm Harold Muliati, and I'm filling in today for Rick Zanotti, who is actually presenting today at the video show in Washington, D.C. He's presenting on streaming live video, and um, he's going to be doing his presentation. Actually, I think he's finishing it up right now, but that's where he is right now. And I'm joined by our co-host, Leslie Price, who is with www.learnappeal.com and it's a great cha great charity that does things with e-learning and and other types types of learning in underserved areas you should check it out and thank uh, you Harold and it's lovely to be here how are you how, how are you doing right now Leslie you you actually just uh sent us a a video of uh your grandson Torin yep yeah, I sent you a video and a photo of the grandson. And no, yeah. I'm good. And I'm just absolutely delighted that we've got um, Johannes Kronje with us today because Johannes and I go back quite a long way in the industry. So it's just lovely to have him on the show. And he's going to so, talk so to Leslie, us. So, Leslie, congratulations. Yeah, hello, people. Uh, Leslie, congratulations. How old did you say the grandson was? Three weeks. And you're keeping him? Yes, of course. Oh, oh really? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll run our intro and we'll be right back. All right. This show is sponsored by Relate Corporation at www.relate.com. Your training and video partner. Hello, I'm Peter Baker. Please visit voiceovermasterclass.com to see details of the training courses I have on offer for new and existing voice talents to further their career by enhancing voice and technical skills as well as essential marketing tips. And we are back. Giannis, how are you doing? Yeah. Well, thanks, and you? Great. And Johannes is coming from a com, coming to us from. Uh, are you you're from Cape Town? Are you currently Cape in Town? Cape Town? Yes, yes. In yes. South Africa. And yeah, and I I met I met Johannes. I mean I I was lived in South Africa as a teenager, and um, but I met Johannes back in the early two thousands when Johannes was a speaker at an event and then he we thought he was so good we then had him to speak as the keynote speaker at our event that i was running when i was at vector and he is the only okay. keynote speaker i have ever known that managed to get the whole audience engaged he sent them on a challenge and their job, and he gave them all kinds of clues and it was like a treasure hunt. And he sent them on this challenge and what they had to do was come back at the end of the event when he was speaking again and give them the, give the results of a challenge. And I've, I've honestly yes. never been at a conference where the keynote speaker actually did something like that. And it was just phenomenal. It was amazing. And Johannes and I have been yeah. friends ever since. There you go. So, Johannes, tell us what you're yeah. up to at the moment. I know you're just back okay. from um, Online Educa in, in Berlin. Online in Berlin, yes, where I did a little talk about creating value in e-learning. Uh, we have a little framework that we made called SILSTI. SILSTI stands for Student Instructor Learner Support System Institutional um, Technology. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, technology. It's six things that one might look at if you're trying to create value from e-learning. And then we also looked at how across those six dimensions, um, we balance the iron triangle in higher education. In other words, we try and see how we balance cost, access, and success um, along each one of those di dimensions. So for students, for instance, success is, access or success is probably the most important, um, but, but then cost is also there. So which of the three are you gonna prioritize? 
Um, and then when you look at the lecturers or the instructors, again, um, which one, how, how do you prioritize those three things? Um, are you paying the lecturers less? Uh, are you going to have less accessible lecturers, etc.? So that was what that talk was about. Um, and, yeah. and that was quite fun because the people filled in a form for themselves um, so that they could go home and say, well, this is how I think I can balance my teaching and learning using technology. But you also today wanted to um, talk about, what was it, Rizo? I can't even remember. <laughs> okay, so let, me tell you, let me tell you the story about um, what kept me up at night as an academic for quite a long time is that uh, I sat in class in a, in a class um, as an adult learner in an MBA class once um, when I'd already been a professor of education for four or five years. And the lecturer in front of the class asked the question, he said, what is the definition of learning? And do you know when you sit in a class and you're in absolute panic in case he now sh says, will you please tell us, Professor Cronier? Yeah. That sort of panic went over me because as many professors of education, there are so many definitions there are of learning. And and are you going to use Vygotsky's definition or who's def and, and what? You so I was a total panic. And then he fortunately, he rescued me by saying learning is being to, able to do something afterwards that you couldn't do before. And I thought, what a brilliant definition of learning. It just covers everything. And so I was really happy. And then it, then it occurred to me, then something really strange happened. About two years later, um, I downloaded an app onto my phone called Waze, W-A-Z-E. -E. It's a GPS um, a, a navigation tool. And one of the things in my life is that I get lost. When I go to places, I get lost. I budget half an hour to get lost. And ever since I've had waves, I've mm -hmm. never got lost again because I can get to wherever I want to in exactly the time that Waze says. It, it, I, I'm, I can pinpoint my estimated time of arrival to one minute. I never got lost again ever, ever since I've, load, I've downloaded Waze. So I can do something that I've never been able to do before. But what have I learned? And so that was problematic for me because now suddenly the definition of learning wasn't working anymore because I've just said definition of learning is to, do, to be able to do something that you couldn't do before. And it really kept me awake at night because what is learning then? And then I came across Steve Wheeler's blog about learning 3.0. And in this specific blog of Steve's, he talks about the fact that learning has become what he calls rhizomatic. Uh, so that we've moved from learning which has a tree structure to learning that has a rhizome structure. And he goes back to Deloise and Guattari's rhizome theory. And rhizome theory says that life is not a tree. Now, remember um, when we first learned um, uh, grammar at school. We learned that a sentence had a subject and a predicate and the subject had an indefinite article yeah. and a noun, etc., etc. And we were given these branching trees. But trees always imply a hierarchy, which means you first got to know the top, top stuff before you know anything else and so on. And, and Deloise and Guattari say, no, don't use it. Use a rhizome, something like a mushroom, which has, it doesn't have roots like a tree does that are hierarchies. It just has tentacles that go everywhere. And, and th that's what the rhizome means. And so Deloise and Guattari have six characteristics. Um, Deloise and Guattari have six characteristics of the rhizome. And, and what I find is that they really help us a great deal in discussing um, how education works. Now, something you need to understand about learning at all is that nobody is able to remember six things. So I'm sitting here thinking, how do I remember six things? And actually, nice trick for any teacher, don't get your kids to remember six things because nobody can remember six things. There are seven deadly sins. I do all of them, but I can't remember any of them. So. Instead of six things, I'll give you three pairs. And those three pairs are 
connectedness and heterogeneity, multiplicity and A signifying rapture, and cartography and decalcomania. And those are the characteristics of the riser. Um, there's a huge drumming contest going on at the back. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh, we, d we don't hear the drumming okay. at all. All right, good. If you're not hearing the drumming, then I'm happy. Okay, so let me go through those characteristics. Those are the six characteristics of the riser. And so instead of knowing, instead of trying to remember all six, you just remember the three pairs. Uh, connectedness and heterogeneity, multiplicity and A signifying rapture, and uh, A signifying rupture, are you, not when you fall to heaven, but rupture, and then finally cartography and decalcomania. So the first one, connectedness, in terms of learning, and this is what makes it very exciting for me for e-learning, it simply means that everything is connected with everything else. And if you learn something in one place, it may be, trigger something completely different somewhere else that had nothing to do with what you were thinking of in the first place. And in fact, what we know about research and so on, research, good research very often happens on the cusp of other research. So um, somebody might say, what if I use uh, things uh, th that, that I know from, um, fr from plants and what if I use that in, in medicine? Uh, for, for instance, um, the, the structure of fishing nets may well be a structure that was found from, from honeycombs that bees make. And so there's no connection between a fishing net and a, and a bee, except, hey, honeycombs. So that's the, the thing about connection and the, the trick in teaching and learning. And e-learning allows us to do that because of the hyperlink. Everything is connected with everything. And the other thing then that that brings me about learning, and that's why I can now, now sleep at night, is that it's not the individual that learns anymore. It's the system that learns as a result of these connections. So when I travel with Waze and I see an accident on the side of the road, I report that. Waze tells everybody behind me that actually, yes, there's an accident now. And so the system has become more clever. Anything I do on a Google-enabled phone tells the AI and Google what I do, and then I become able to do even more things, not because I'm getting cleverer, but because the system is getting cleverer, and people who do things like I do also do. And that's what connectedness means for me. I find the whole concept of connectedness really, really exciting. The next one, then, is heterogeneity. Heterogeneity means different. So any two things are different. When I do this as a speech somewhere, I usually take up those ghastly plastic bottles that they put on every table at a conference center, and I pick up two of those plastic bottles and I hold them in the air, and I say to people, look at these two bottles. They are identical in every way, and yet they are completely different. One is the right-hand bottle, the other one is the left-hand bottle. One bottle I may have drank out, which means that it has some of my DNA on it, and the other one doesn't, etc. You can start taking two identical bottles. You can start taking the difference out. But what that means for e-learning and for any form of learning, really, is we need to indicate difference. What makes your product different from mine? And when we're sitting with proliferation, as we do in the Internet, and, and if we in learning systems, in material that we want people to learn and so on, we need to let people know what is different. And so heterogeneity and difference uh, is and, and so what I always like to ask people is so how are you showing people that things are different um, and so those that then is the second one of the two connectedness and heterogeneity and of course what m makes the rhizome so interesting is things are all interconnected with one another anyway things have to be heterogeneic if they are going to be different uh, at least if you're going to connect things they must be different if they're the same, you can't connect them. So th that, th th those things become really exciting for me. And then there's the next pair, and the next pair is multiplicity and A signifying rupture. And by rupture, I mean breaking things apart. But let's look at multiplicity first. And I always explain to people that multiplicity means that the multiple is the unit. That's what Deloise and Guattari says. Don't try and find an individual thing. The multiple is what we're actually looking for. 
And that becomes very evident in mathematics education, where I say to people, you know, there are many different ways of getting the sum, sum wrong. You, you, you don't have to get it wrong in only one way. Um, and so if, if you look at teaching multiplication tables or any other piece of mathematics that you teach, there are various methods that people can use. So you don't teach just the one. You teach the multiple. And, and in that way, then, the multiple for, for Deloitte and Guattari becomes the unit. And, Leslie, you must start talking because you're being terribly quiet. Yeah, no, um, because, because I'm wondering, I'm wondering because an awful lot of people who listen to this um, program, to listen to this, to e-learn chat, are in the world of work-based learning. And, you know, yeah, eventually in right. my career, as you know, it was work-based learning that I got involved yes. in. So yeah, how does yeah. that fit in to work-based learning? How does okay. it all okay. fit, fit together in in, yes. in, yes. in the workplace? Because And one of the things that we're always asked, and, you know, I judge on the Learning Technology Awards, and one of the yes. things that we now are quite insistent on when people are, you know, putting in for awards is how do you measure it? How do you measure impact? Mm, so mm, does, mm. This, does the way that you're thinking with this rhizomatic yeah. the, does that allow you know how does it apply in the workplace and if it does how do you measure it okay let's let's start with how it applies in the workplace so to me any form of workplace learning by definition has to be rhizomatic because every person is learning in a different workplace so in the first place then um the connectedness, what you're doing is connected with your work. As a worker, you are connected with all the workers around you. And, and in the workplace, you know, one of the things that you get taught when you start working, the first thing you get taught is the corporate uh, organizational chart, which is that very hierarchy that rhizomatic learning tries to break down. Because really, the, the organizational corporate chart tells you nothing other than who signs your leave for. Because the person above you is not the one you work for. The customer is the one you work for. The person who gives you work is the next person in your supply chain. It's not the one on top of you. So one needs to break down those sort of silos. And, and so for the workplace, the connectedness, um, I think, it goes right at the very top of it. And what it means then is we need to, to design granular learning so that we can connect them differently. And then again, <clears throat> Sorry, the heterogeneity. Your workplace is different from mine. What I need to learn, what I need to do is I need to, to know that what I'm learning today will be different tomorrow because I'm teaching a class today to a group of students. I teach exactly the same um, class to a different group of students. Everything's different. I've got to rethink my, my work. Um, in, in any form of complex work, every customer, every client who stands in front of you is different from the previous client and we have to have a different approach um, and and from that then comes the multiplicity i want to talk a little bit about the measuring though because i've got this real problem with the world's constant um desire to measure particularly to measure externally to so i want to measure it from outside now i have a little app on my phone that belongs to my um uh, car insurance company and now what this thing does is it measures when i when i accelerate rapidly it measures if i decelerate rapidly harsh braking it measures fast cornering it measures um uh, movement of the phone which means that i might be talking on the phone and it measures whether i exceed the speed limit or not and out of that it gives me a grading and it compares me to other people and if I start getting really high stars, it will give me, the insurance company will give me a, a reduction on my premium that I'm paying. So, but now look at what that thing is doing. It's measuring certain very measurable behaviors and assuming from that that I'm being a good driver. Now, the classic way of measuring whether somebody's a good driver is you get a driving, a driving test person to sit next to that person, you are then scared witless because of this person sitting next to you. 
you pop the clutch, you make various other mistakes because you've got this person sitting next to you. And of course, you follow all the rules. The person leaves the car and you drive like a bat out of hell just to get away from what is happening. So where's the accuracy and the measurement? Yes, you've measured, but there's no reliability. There's no validity in what you've done. And then heaven forbid, you get a multiple choice driver's license test to see if you're a learner's driver. The only thing that multiple choice test tells you is that you can't drive. It will never be able to tell you if you can drive. So I am very interested in companies, and, and, and this is where I think AI can help us a great deal, in measuring things that are happening in the background that give an indication of learning. So here's the one that I've been discovering, and I'm wondering how I'm going to measure that. But I teach on the first year, and I teach two groups a group of traditionally what would be called bright students and a group of what would traditionally be called not so bright students. And what I've noticed both groups is that the best student in the class is invariably the fun to submit an assignment. I do all my assignments online. I use a virtual classroom for that. So my best students are the ones who are first to submit. My worst students are the ones who are last to submit. Um, and and if, whether that's submitting a document Ask, or whether it's watching an online video and doing a multiple to choice test in it, first students are always finished first. Also, my students who attend most are the ones who do best. So I'm beginning to ask myself, do I actually have to grade their assignments at all? Or do I just take the time when they submit and the frequency of their um, class attendance and give them a grade based on that? So I I'm really interested, if we're talking about workplace learning, in alternative measurements of that learning. If you think about Kirkpatrick uh, in his measurements, remember Kirkpatrick says at the lowest level, we measure yeah. smiles, whether people actually like it, etc. And at the highest level, he says, is the organization working better? And I think that's probably a much better indicator. Don't measure the, the yeah. individual, measure the performance. Um, th there are horror stories in, in Kirkpatrick's work about where we train security personnel because they are rude and then eventually we end up having really nice kind security personnel and the the merchandise walks out of our shops because the security guards are now very polite but they're no longer security guards so uh, your training was so successful that your people didn't actually make it we we even had a bank in south africa that went bankrupt because its training was so successful it wanted to be the best producer of micro lending, the best micro lending bank in the country. And so it geared all its training on to getting the be being the best micro lending bank in the country. And so they also were the bank with the with the largest bad debt in the country. And that made them bankrupt. So, you know, what are we measuring? Um, so I, I think that was a nice question, Leslie. So um, if I put my glasses on and look at my phone, um, then it says we have about 10 minutes left, and so we can look at the other couple of rhizomatic things. What are you thinking, Leslie? No, I just know it's just that when we look at, when, we, when I always tell people when they're measuring, they've got to look yeah. at, they've got to have a baseline, so they've got to know what they're measuring against, and exactly. they're then going to be looking, they're then going to be looking at improvements in performance, not did you learn yeah. something, yes, tick the box, click next here. You know, what impact did it have on personal performance related to yeah. a, um, an, a, a business objective which is valuable to the organization? As, as you say, with yeah. that micro lending that you were talking about, I can see Harold's yeah. chomping at the bit there. Oh, I, I just want to say, and that, that goes back to what you were saying before at, in terms of looking at learning as um, the learner being able to do something they couldn't before. It, it's, it's connected to the uh, need, needing to have a performance increase from the training. But uh, exactly. I just wanted to add that. So uh, continue. Listen. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but, but Leslie, I want to continue with that and say that, again, what Steve Wheeler was saying, it's the system that's learning. So it's not just the individual learner performance that you need to measure. You need to measure whether that company or that group within which that person is, is now doing better. And, and this is what, why, again, I like 
micro learning and rhizome theory because it then tells me that it's every piece of learning needs to be tailor made to that specific learner where that specific learner is at any given time. So um, th then let's go on in, in our um, little story. We've had multiplicity, um, we've had uh, connectedness. Um, so multiplicity happens because of a signifying rupture. So a signifying rupture means if you think about any rhizome plant, um, like a clivia or a ginger plant or something like that, the way you multiply those plants is by breaking them in half. So the moment you break it, you have two more plants. And that's what a signifying rupture means in terms of learning uh, and rhizomatic learning. So the question we ask ourselves when we teach somebody something is, how can you break that off and learn somewhere else? So that comes back to your workplace learning. I'm teaching you something at your desk, but how can you break that off and apply that again somewhere else? And in education, we're not unfamiliar with that. The term has simply been called transfer forever. But in, in this case, we're saying, yeah, but let's take it more. Let's, let's look at the organic nature of breaking off a piece of learning and making that piece of learning grow somewhere else. Um, and and so, so that's what a signifying rupture comes. And it's about also uh, teaching learners, as if you like, um, how to break off their own learning, how to apply learning that they've done in one place in another context. I work at a university of technology, which has a very strong focus on vocational education. People keep on wanting to say to me, uh, you know what happens when you sit in a plane, whoever sits next to you has also been at school or university and therefore also knows exactly how it should work and they, they want to tell you that and so I often get told um, that our students must be made much more workplace ready and then I just sort of get really cross because if I make my student ready for one specific workplace then that student is completely unready for any other workplace because people work in competition with one another if I teach a student to be to do only one specific thing, they can't work anywhere else. They won't be promoted, they're just stuck. So you've got to have to teach for transfer, teach for the ability to go and do something else somewhere else. Um, and again, I think what one needs to measure then in one's learners is their agility, the, the ability for learners to break off what they've learned on one place and apply it somewhere else. So what are your last two then? What's the last two of your rhizomatic? <laughs> okay, so the last two, we have three minutes. Um, the last two are cartography and decalcomania. Cartography is the fact that every person draws her own map. Now, to show that to you, I used to teach my students branching tree diagrams and I used to teach them tables and so on. And then I learned about mind maps and I started drawing mind maps on the board instead of giving students bullet points I'd give them mind maps and then I would yeah, Tony, look around Tony, Bazan, Tony Bazan's work yes, Tony Bazan's work yeah. yep. then I would turn around and I would see that the students had copied the mind map from the board and it's on their desk which means that I have a map on the board but they have a tracing and cartography says learning is your own map. It is not the tracing of somebody else's learning. And so what I'm doing now when I teach students is I get them to make their own map. So don't take the, the, the textbook and then use every, cha every chapter heading of the textbook as one of the branches of your mind map and then the sub-branches as the sub-paragraphs in your textbook. Put yourself in the middle of the mind map and then tell me how you relate to the topic that is on that mind map. So if you're doing urban and regional planning, put yourself in the mind map and say to yourself, to what extent, if I look at urbanization, to what extent am I urbanized or not urbanized? To what extent do I notice the features of urbanization around me? So you put yourself in the map in that way, you can't have plagiarism because every student's map will of necessity be different from every other student's map because they are different. So that's the trick of cartography. We need to teach our learners that they must draw their own maps. And, and your workplace, again, is the map 
it's your career, a career uh, from Latin, uh, the, the route that you're taking. So again, it's the map that sits there. The last one is my favorite word of all times, which is decalcomania. Decalcomania is the endlessly repeating patterns that we get when we make decals. So you'll remember a decal as any of those little transfers, a piece of paper with a design on it. You wet it, you put it against the surface, you take it off and the design remains behind. And you can do it again and again and again. And so you will end up having endlessly repeated patterns of things that are essentially the same. And if you remember, Leslie, the old screen savers that we, that we yeah. all grew up with called fractal, and they had those yeah. rec ever-recurring triangles. That, to me, is decalcomania. And what that means for learning is that we simply learn pattern recognition. And, and what our job is as instructors or teachers is to teach people, is to, teach people um, to recognize those patterns. And, and that's what decalcomania is about. So there I've gone through all of them, and I can go backwards through them to show you that, I, that I've done that. Decalcomania is about <laughs> endlessly repeating patterns. Cartography is about the maps that we make. A signifying rupture means that we break off learning from other pieces, um, which results in a multiplicity of different things where the multiple becomes the unit, where everything is different, and yet everything is connected. And that's my story. No, oh, it's, inter it's interesting stuff. It's interesting stuff. Do you have any other questions, Harold? Is Johannes just blown your mind? <laughs> <laughs> We've lost Harold. We can't hear him. We've lost Harold. Uh, I had my cough switch on. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting way to think about learning and... Um, uh, decalcomania in, in particular, I, I, I thought it was kind of uh, fascinating. It, it's a little bit different from what I had learned before, because I, I, I had learned something called decalcomania studying art in school. It was a uh, sur yeah. surrealistic sort of visual brainstorming technique yeah. that we did, but yeah. I think yeah. it, it is yeah. sort of yeah. similar with the pattern recognition and stuff yeah. like that. I would, I would do yourself a favor and just use Google Images and Google for decalcomania over images. The mind just boggles. It is just so amazing. So, um, and and it, it sort of just, just yeah, it, it sort of causes a mind explosion. Just Google for it and you'll see. Will do. Well, the uh, decalcomania yeah. that I did before was actually put uh, with uh, putting paint between two sheets and sort of pulling it apart. And That's it would... right. And yeah. you pull it apart. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's That's an interesting the start topic. of it. Yeah. I've never but done then, anything but like that. What, but then it gives you endlessly repeating patterns. You also know that with that decalcomania, you then fold the paper in another way and put more bits in and then fold it another way. And then you get these patterns that, that, that happen. So, yeah. yeah. It's very but, that, exciting. but that also, I mean, it, I know it's going to sound crazy, but um, when I was in my teens, my mother sent oh. me to secretarial college. Because she said, yes. I, every girl needs a skill, and I had to learn yeah. to touch type. And I still yes. can touch type now, and I touch type yeah. by the pattern. So I, although when I've got my yes. hands on the keyboard, I never ever have to look at the keys. Exactly. I can look yeah. straight at yep. the screen, yeah. and yeah. I just know yes. where all the different keys are, and I know exactly, exactly. where they are. Because there's two, yeah. there's a little bump on the J and there's a little bump on the yeah. F. And yeah. most people don't yeah. know that that little bump yeah. is on the keyboard to show you where exactly your where, your, where your fingers go. And exactly. it's That's touch clear. typing. That skill is all yeah. about patterns. Yes. Literally, that's one of my favorite party tricks. I also learned to touch type when I was about nine years old. And it's one of my favorite party tricks when I speak at a conference or something and I get audience feedback. When any person speaking to me, I would look that person straight in the eye and then type what that person is saying. And it would yeah. appear in the back. And it sort of creeps the audience out that you, when you do that. Yeah. Anyway, we're about time's up now, Johannes. Thanks ever so yep. much for, for giving Thank up you, your yes. dinner or part of your dinner time to Absolutely. come and chat to us. Yeah, yeah. It was good fun. Thank you so much. And, and you say I'll find, I must just look for the link and then we'll see. Yeah, okay, Yeah. cool.
and it would be and you just have to persuade the organizers closer still or don taylor to invite you over to the uk yeah. and then you can bring to speak at learning technologies and then you can bring francie good with idea. you good yeah. idea yes yeah. <laughs> okay you thank you so much guys. you can bring francie good. okay then I'll take care that. then johannes okay, okay thank bye you. thank you bye for bye, coming on you. and uh, uh for anyone that wants to read more about what johannes was talking about as far as rhizomatic learning goes, you can check out his site. It's linked below, and that's the URL on the screen there. So uh, take care, everyone, and we'll see you next time on eLearn Chat. Thanks, then. Bye. Bye. Bye.